Welcome to the third in our Contemplating Easter series. The two previous reflections explored aspects of Christ's qualities of sacrifice and service as he journeyed to the cross. Today, we focus on the elusive subject of humility. To start, we recall some wise thoughts on the significance of humility in spiritual inquiry and the Christian way. Then, in trying to ground ourselves in the human and practical aspects of this virtue, the Apostle Peter comes under the spotlight as one who, in his humanness, fluctuates between being so close to our Lord and yet almost simultaneously so distant as to require deep rebuke from Jesus. We take time to ask how Peter's humility, and indeed ours, affects the relationship with God. Finally, carrying these thoughts of hapless Peter with us, I invite you to pray with the icon of Christ washing Peter's feet at the Last Supper, a copy of which you can access. The icon was written by Amanda de Pulford, and we are very grateful to Amanda for permission to use a copy. The original of the icon can be found in Canterbury Cathedral. But first, some thoughts about humility. Thomas Merton observed that it is almost impossible to overestimate the value of true humility and its power in the spiritual life. That humility is the surest sign of strength. That the gift of prayer is inseparable from the grace of humility where meditation starts with the realisation of our nothingness and helplessness in God's presence where the perfection of humility is found in transforming union, and only God can bring us to that purity through the fires of interior trial. We are nothing but eternally special. In our world, humility can appear to be seen as passive, a weak character trait even perhaps compulsorily imposed by people or societies. But is it really any of these things? Or is it more a quality of life, a gift from God, to be sought and developed where the ultimate act of humility is to seek this gift from him with all our hearts? The word has its root in the Latin humus, meaning soil or earth. To be humble is to be down to earth, realistic, honest, truthful. Genesis illustrates how Adam and Eve's very temptation was to give up being of the earth, to be divine, the ultimate act of pride. And so paradise was lost, through lack of humility and true humanity. So often, as the tide of humility ebbs, the flood of human gone wrongness fills the void with excess arrogance, leading in extremis to escalating conflict or oppression. You might like to pause the recording for a few minutes here, while you reflect on what you have heard. Then when you are ready, please continue. St Benedict and Humility St Benedict, in his rule, places at the heart of his teaching three key qualities of monastic life. Obedience, silence, and our subject, humility. To describe the way of humility, he uses the image of a ladder by which we descend by exaltation, of ourselves that is, and we ascend by humility. We descend by exaltation, 
and we ascend by humility. The ladder is our life, which will be raised to heaven if we have a humble heart. One upright is our body, the other our soul, with the rungs being twelve steps of humility towards perfect love. In the time available, we can do no more than nod to these twelve steps, but they speak of fear as in awe of God, loving not one's own will in satisfying our own desires, submission to superiors, for love of God to release love, within the above obedience, embracing suffering patiently, not concealing but humbly confessing wrong actions or thoughts, aware that secrecy delights the devil, being content with prevailing circumstances regardless of status. Pronouncement of, as well as belief in the heart of the greater worthiness of others. Doing nothing but that which is encouraged by the common rule and example of community. Restraint of speech, unless invited to contribute. Being wary of crude laughter. Speaking gently, without undue laughter, humbly with gravity, few but reasonable words. Letting humility be evident in bearing, no less than in heart. This is integrity, where outer and inner person are one, having ascended by falling, deeply aware of our own faults, therefore not complaining of faults in others, praising God in thanks for his mercy. Of course, the Benedictine rule is but one rule, but recognised for its balance and influence on community life. Certainly monastic, but also as an example beyond. The importance attached to humility has much to say to us in these days of celebrity. Again, this may be a good point to pause the recording, to reflect for a few minutes. Please continue when you are ready. Peter the Headstrong So, with this brief backdrop on humility, we turn to the disciple Peter to recall just some of the familiar stories about him and ask ourselves whether humility featured in these stories. In the story of the disciples' extraordinary catch of fish, Peter's first inclination is to question Jesus' advice and judgment as to where best to cast the net. And this, despite just having been present as Jesus taught the multitudes. Very quickly, he realises the fullness of his sinfulness when his doubt is answered by a huge netful of fish. Yet Jesus patiently reassures him. When Jesus walks on the water to the disciples, he offers reassurance to them in their anxiety. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. But Peter's first inclination is to diminish and test Jesus' word. If it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Remember Satan's tempting words. If you are the Son of God. Quickly, Peter is again undone in his proud and unready bravado, 
causing him to flounder and sink before Jesus stretches out his hand and catches him. But not much humility evident. With the hemorrhaging woman's touch, we hear Peter challenging whether Jesus' own personal and internal sense of his own power leaving his own body is reliable and credible. Speculating, surely it was the crowds jostling. We recall Peter having received supernatural revelation of Jesus' true identity, the Christ, the Son of God. Then only shortly afterwards, he presumes to rebuke Jesus for predicting the need for his own death. What pride! Peter descends in his exaltation of himself, with Jesus' severe rebuke ringing in his ears, that Satan speaks man's thoughts, not God's, through him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Peter bumbling around self-importantly and irrelevantly, till he is undone and terrified by God's voice. Afterwards, as usual, Jesus gently reassures with touch and voice. Finally, we hear Peter's extravagant and indignant promises of loyalty to Jesus, I never will fall away, showing how little he knows himself. This prompts Jesus, who clearly sees through and knows Peter far better than he knows himself, to predict the disciples' three devastating denials. Yet he loves him none the less, with full restoration to come later. We can contrast Peter's well-meaning, perhaps unwitting, exaltation of himself with the earlier aspirational images of humility. So perhaps another good point to pause for a short while as you and as you reflect, it may help to consider these three questions. How typical are Peter's reactions of natural humanity? And dare we ask, of ourselves. Where can we picture ourselves on Benedict's ladder? What is the source of Peter's first thoughts in these accounts? Jesus washes Peter's feet. So holding these various accounts of Peter in mind, we come to the story of Jesus washing Peter's feet, their final, deepest, intimate exchange before Christ's passion, both physically and spiritually, showing Peter the way and truth of both that which separates him from, but also that which can unify him with his heart's desire of life, in Jesus. We read from John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 11. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he was come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin 
and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not everyone was clean. Let us try to approach the scene. Jesus knows the time and place is close for him to fulfil his purpose, to complete his self-offering and return to the Father in the attainment of the perfection of holiness and love. But at this momentous hour, he is surrounded by disciples bickering about who is the greatest. He knows Judas is about to betray him. Peter will deny him, all the disciples will desert him, as above all he approaches the cross. Despite this worldly chaos, he is possessed with a sense of divine commission. He displays his divine majesty in the humility of washing their feet, a slave of love to them. God humbling himself before them in a way that totally neutralises any opportunity for pride in basking in the reflected glory of the traditional powerful leader they hoped they had hitched their wagons to. He shows us that mankind's humility starts with a readiness to receive service, perfectly cleansed lest we risk our wills not acting from God as centre, but from self, thereby contaminating. To accept service acknowledges our dependence on others. Is our first thought, what can I do for God? Answer, nothing. Or, what could God do for me? Answer, Please cleanse me, in a way I cannot cleanse myself, as I confess my need and my unique stains. Perhaps we are prompted to ask ourselves the questions. Do we shrink from, or can we accept God who humbles himself before us? Can we worship the infant in the lowly manger, the one offering menial service, Humility incarnate. The one who is entitled to claim all service of us, and yet instead first gives service. So Peter, loyal, generous, impulsive Peter, having watched the other disciples succumb to having their feet washed, including Judas, perhaps feels the need to articulate the confusion they all feel. For whatever reason, Peter's incomplete loyalty and generosity of spirit cause him to rebel once again, just as in the stories above. He cannot help himself in raising his objections to Jesus three times across the gap of pride. The first time, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? He might just as well have said, 
Lord, with respect, I think you're well off the mark here. Unwittingly as insulting as he could have been to Jesus. And a precarious strategy had he been speaking as a secular military officer to his conquering superior. How familiar this ground sounds to me. Perhaps for others also. But Jesus knows Peter and the frontier of this test for him. Patiently, he gives Peter a second chance to receive service by assuring him that all will be revealed, but with a gentle but firm reminder that he, Jesus, does know best. The second instance, Peter, unhearing, certainly unlistening, digs both heels in. No, you shall never wash my feet. Can one sense a reddish veil of irritation, anger, obstinacy? I won't be told what to do. Is it Peter's pride that now obscures Jesus' message and indeed rejects his gift of humble service? To continue the military analogy, Peter would now be bordering on gross insubordination territory. But Jesus draws Peter gently towards a sharp definition of the lesson that he has yet to learn about the choice that is before him. In his statement, unless I wash you, you shall have no part with me. Jesus does not lay down a condition. He clarifies Peter's choice through the veil. Is it when we listen to Jesus that we love him most? And the third instance. Peter, still blind to the fullness of Jesus' message and offer, foolishly imagines that Jesus must still be in error. Surely he means his whole body, not just his feet. In other words, now Peter wants more than Jesus is offering, or knows best, or both. Perhaps it was Peter's intention for his loyalty and generosity of himself to please Jesus. But instead, he remained off the mark. And it was not the absolute faith in his word that Jesus was looking for to enable Peter to walk cleanly in his footsteps. Can we see how it is often when we, we too can be so close and yet just ever so slightly out of focus, just ever so slightly off pitch, just off the mark, that we render the true message opaque, cacophonous. The miss is as good as a mile. It was only through the refining and humbling fire of his own experience of Christ's passion that Peter finally comes to restoration with the risen Christ at breakfast on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Then feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Only then we read in Acts how Peter is finally able to step into and fulfil the extraordinary ministry that God planned for him, as he understood the cleansing by the word of his whole person, whilst also receiving in humility the daily cleansing and refreshing of his feet from the defilement of the world in his walk in Christ's footsteps. And so I invite you 
now to access the icon of Jesus washing Peter's feet. Please take as little or as long as you wish with the icon. And as you pray with it, open your heart to the leading of God's Spirit. If you find it helpful, please ponder any of the following questions or others that may arise in your prayer time. How do we allow Christ to serve each of us? What part of our whole person do we withhold from the cleansing of the word? When, in the course of our day, do we allow Christ to cleanse us from the stains of life in the world? When do we know better than Christ and reject the service he offers? If any are unclean, dare we ask, Lord, is it I? When you are ready, let us join in our closing prayer. Grant us, O Lord Jesus Christ, to desire to have you as our Saviour, not in the next world, but in this, that you will change and alter all that is within us, as you helped the blind man to see and the lame to walk, that your nature may be formed and created in our hearts, your humility and self-denial, your love of the Father, the desire of doing his will and seeking only his honour, that so the kingdom of God may be in us now and our possession forever, world without end. Amen. Thank you for listening.